Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Um, a 50-year-old male mm. came to ER with complaints of sudden onset bleeding from uh, his right side of the neck where there was a biopsy site. Okay. Uh, patient on initial 10 second assessment, uh, airway was patent, patient was conscious, he was able to say his name. Uh, coming to breathing, saturation was 96% in room air, respiratory rate of around 26 per minute. Okay. Coming to circulation, BP was 120 by 70, heart rate of 117 per minute. Mm. Uh, at this point, uh, we had inserted two large bore IV cannulas and uh, we had started with direct compression over the uh, ooze mm. uh, on the neck. Uh, Disability wise, TCS was E4, V5, M6 mm. and uh, temperature was, uh, exposure was, temperature was 98.6 degree Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, we asked to provide blankets to prevent hypothermia. Okay. Um, coming to adjuncts to primary survey, mm. uh, VBG wise, pH was 7.46 with mm. PCO2 of 32, bicarb of 22 and a lactate of 4.6. And uh, total counts uh, were 9000, hemoglobin of 14, hematocrit was 42 platelet of 174 and a CRP of 8. Uh, so at this time we had arranged for blood products, uh, arranged for blood products and uh, also in, uh, gave tranexamic acid 1 gram uh, IV over 20 minutes to the patient. Okay. Uh, coming to sample history, a uh, 50 year old male uh, patient who is a known case of refractory diffuse cell, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, mm. status post chemotherapy radiotherapy, mm. Came to ER with complaints of sudden onset bleeding from the right side of his neck, where an ulcerated wound was already there, uh, which was his previous biopsy site. And there was no history of hematemesis, hemoptysis, uh, straining, or any previous history of bleed from the same site. Uh, he's not allergic to any known medications. Uh, past medical history: his known case of DLBCL, uh, where a PET CT had shown a heterogeneously enhancing conglomerated lymph node mass, mm. which involves the right cervical level. Uh, at two and uh, li right cervical level two and three, and the lesion is encasing the right common carotid artery completely. So after this, we had informed the head and neck uh, department uh, on call, and uh, they arrived. And patient, uh, they started with compressions. Uh, they started with compressions, and within few minutes, actually, patient's cardiac monitor started showing bradycardia. Uh, patient had uprolling of eyes, and then when we felt for the central pulse, patient had arrested. So we went ahead with high quality CPR according to ACLS protocol. We started with adrenaline 1 mg every 3 to 5 minutes. We took a repeat VBG, repeat VBG showing a hemoglobin of 8.3, pH of 6.69, lactate of 22 with potassium of 6.2 and bicarb of 10. Uh, what was the lactate initially? 4.6. Okay. Now it became 22. So uh, we in gave antihyperkalemic measures, uh, calcium gluconate by uh, sodium bicarbonate were given and then we went ahead with securing the airway. Uh, it was initially difficult uh, f with autopharyngeal, uh, autotracheal uh, insertion. We went, uh, head and neck team had already uh, went gone ahead and uh, did a tracheostomy for the patient. And on the other hand, they uh, did ligation of the common carotid bar, external carotid artery at that point. We uh, initiated a massive transfusion protocol and we gave 3 pint PRBC, 1 SDP and 2 FFP to the patient. Then uh, ROSC was achieved after 45 minutes of resuscitation. Okay. So, uh, so uh, what we are dealing with here is a? Carotid blowout. So carotid blowout syndrome. So it's one of the uh, rarest of the phenomena. And actually mm -hmm. we don't see very frequently. But in our ED because we are dealing a lot of with head and neck cancers. Mm -hmm. Once in six months, we are seeing carotid blowouts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, carotid blowout, what will be the presentation to the emergency room? So, this was a straightforward one because there was an external wound mm -hmm. uh, which was not healing mm -hmm. and uh, all the risk factors for carotid blowout was already there. Receiving a radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. Mostly, uh, the next important thing, it, it was very adjacent to the carotid also. Yes. The tumor was also adjacent to the carotid. Mm -hmm. So, these are the uh, major risk factors that we, when we consider for a carotid blowout. So, what will be the presentation of carotid blowout in an emergency room? So, when will you suspect? This is a straightforward presentation. Mm -hmm. So, what are the other atypical presentations that the mm -hmm. patient can come up with? Usually, the presenting symptoms are hematemesis, mm. hemoptysis. If patient has a tracheostomy, bleeding around the tracheostomy site, mm. patient will be diaphoretic. Okay. Uh, there will be a narrowing of the pulse pressure. Okay. Then there will be hypotension, tachycardia, or patient will directly present in hemorrhagic shock. Okay. The most, uh, what I had seen, like three, four cases, the two cases, what they presented, they presented bleeding from the oral, oral cavity. cavity. Mm. 
So that was the only presentation that they came up with. So always remember somebody is coming with head and neck uh, cancers. Uh, they have done some radiation therapy and all those uh, uh, surgical exploration and all those things. Always keep in your mind carotid blowout as one of the differential diagnoses. Where the timely intervention, if you are not going to either ligate or you have an angioembolization or you are going to do a surgical stenting, the patient is not going to be saved. So these are all uh, very tricky situations where we need to identify and treat it immediately. So the risk factors, one, two, three. Uh, risk factors usually it is uh, most commonly seen in uh, soft tissue necrosis and um, mucopitinous fistulas if you okay. are present. Uh, mostly at high risk are head and neck tumor patients, especially on radiation patients. Uh, long term tracheostomies, any active infection, any pharyngocutaneous fistulas, uh, any uh, Tissues, uh, recurrent tumor infection, severe radiation damage. Okay, yeah. so the, uh, you have to remember malignancy, mm. head and neck malignancy with radiation. Mm. So that is the most important thing that you can keep in your mind. Mm. And they will be already on tracheostomy mm. also. They can present as a tracheostomy mm. bleed also, mm. as you said. So keep those things in your mind and uh, features of hemorrhagic mm. shock. Mm. What you see in a classical hemorrhagic shock, you will be able to see in here. You are having a bleeding from the carotid mm. directly. Mm. So how can you classify this carotid blood syndrome? What are the three categories? Three categories, I said. Either it will be a threatened mm. or it will be impending or it will be active bleed. Threat okay. So, threatened? Threatened is usually it is not bleeding, but on imaging, we see that there is extra vestition of blood. Okay. So, we have some time to act. act. Uh, we can easily understand, okay, this fellow is going to have mm. probably a pseudoaneurysm is already mm. formed mm. and he can have any time a rupture of this thing. Mm. So, we can intervene and we can prevent it from going from a carotid blowout completely. So, that is a class one. Then the next one? Pending is patient is having bleeding, like any oral bleeding on and off, but it is self-limiting. Uh, patient is not into hemorrhagic shock. This patient so, can be taken up for investigation. So, you will have sentinel episodes in between, in between. Yeah. They are coming and going off. It is after like they came to the OPD, they did yeah. some packing, it stopped. Yeah. Something of that sort history you will get. Yeah. And finally, the third one, what we had here, yeah. it's actively bleeding and that too in an outside hospital setting. Yeah. So, that is the category 3 that we have. Yeah. And category 3 is very dangerous because we have to uh, immediately stop the bleeding, otherwise the patient is going to die. Yeah. Now, let's come back uh, to this case. So, what you feel would have gone wrong in this case or not, uh, what could have been the reason for the cardiac arrest, we have to think in that terms because uh, the treatment that you are going to provide uh, is only going to be the compression initially in the emergency room and the rest everything is your management of the hemorrhage that is you are giving blood products and all those things. So initially, uh, we had actually just put direct pressure over the wound, not too deep because it can uh, reduce perfusion to the brain. But once the hedonic team came, actually they had to explore, they had to see from where the bleeding is. And once exploring started, then patient went into hypotension. So the two reasons what I felt was maybe uh, the hypotension would have been such tremendous. The patient went into a bradycardia and shock or otherwise there is a, already the tumor is surrounding by the carotid. So the carotid body also should be involved in this obviously. So when you are do, doing a lot of exploration near the carotid body, you can definitely induce a bradycardia. So, bradycardia can cause that also will be a possibility, but there is nothing what we can prevent about this in this situation. So, when this sort of patient comes, the initial challenges will be the first one is to secure the airway. So, uh, securing the airway, head and neck tumor malignancy is one of the worst nightmare for an emergency physician because already radiation is given. So, a lot of fibrosis will be there. You don't get any mouth opening. So, the immediately when you feel this sort of patient, no need to wait further. Uh, mouth opening is not there. You can try maybe a blind nasal intubation. So that is what we can try maybe a blind nasal intubation initially or a, maybe a uh, bronchoscope guided uh, intubation when meanwhile somebody is trying for a surgical airway. Till that time you can definitely try that. But rather than going ahead with a jet ventilation immediately, it will be always better to convert that because jet ventilation is a temporary measure. So rather than making into an proper cricothyroidotomy and putting in a uh, tube inside or a tracheostomy will be an ideal. Actually what they did was they did the cut the cricothyroid membrane and they extended the wound and made into a tracheostomy then they put an uh, ET tube, six size ET tube over it. So the same thing it's like a modified cricothyroidotomy converted to a tracheostomy sort of a thing. It is not a hundred percentage uh, tracheostomy. So they have to secure the airway that is the only thing that we need to keep uh, in our mind. But again uh, surgical airway again radiation neck can be quite challenging because 
when you put uh, the incision there can be profuse bleeding so there will be fibrosis so it will not be normal anatomical landmark so when you look into the normal uh, you are looking for the laryngeal handshake so that is a method by which you can just uh, roll uh, your uh, larynx with the both the uh, both your thumb and the index finger and you just with the tongue and the middle finger and you just wrap it down uh, where exactly is the cricothyroid cartilage we have two methods one is like coming down and you can come through the prominent portion and come down here you will get the cricothyroid membrane so that is one method instead of that this is called as laryngeal handshake so you're just shaking the cricothyroid so that uh, tra uh, shaking the uh, trachea the larynx so that you are able to see the exact uh, uh, tracheal rings and from that you are tra uh, tracing down the cricothyroid membrane so there are different way whichever is comfortable because you are stabilizing here the trachea mm -hmm. the other one you are not stabilizing the trachea mm -hmm. so it can go around and uh, you might not be putting an incision in the correct place mm -hmm. so one method is doing that so in this group of patient it is difficult mm -hmm. to uh, identify uh, a cricothyroid and do but luckily for the, this fellow we could get a tracheal uh, incision and we convert it into a tracheostomy mm -hmm. so that is one thing suppose he has come with an sentinel event which might be the initial presentation yes. when he came into the emergency mm -hmm. he was conscious oriented mm -hmm. it's the bleeding stopped mm -hmm. what are the options of treatment we have to go with the ct angiogram which is the uh, treatment as uh, investigation of choice or a uh, digital subtraction angiography after that uh, after we uh, identify the bleeding point or any aneurysm that is there we have to go with either stenting or uh, we can uh, do uh, intervention it will be can embolization. Uh, embolization can be done so the wherever there is a pseudo aneurysm we can coil off the pseudo aneurysm or else we need to find out where the bleeder is and it's basically intervention radiology you have to take him to the cath lab mm -hmm. and do this procedure so that is on either stenting mm -hmm. or you need to uh, go ahead and uh, do embolization if that all that is not available we have to take to the uh, surgical theater for ligation and uh, for the surgical management so that is the uh, major part about this so then uh, regarding massive transmission protocol you discuss regarding massive transmission protocol uh, when will you activate okay this patient requires a massive transmission protocol in the ed especially so when patient is in uh, class 4 hemorrhagic shock okay uh, we have to go ahead with uh, class 4 class i'll say class 3 itself three, uh, you class might require class 3 at any point of time it will go to a class 4 class 3 class 4 hemorrhagic shock, shock. so that is one thing then mm -hmm. sir uh, rapid drop of hemoglobin like from 14 it became 3 uh, uh, rapid drop of hemoglobin in an uh, because hemo concentration will be there a lot of hemo concentration hemoglobin is never a measure yeah. so keep that in mind hemoglobin is never a measure for a transmission mm -hmm. in a hemorrhagic shock mm -hmm. hypotension you see that there is hypotension uh, the patient means hypotension means either ongoing in class 3 or class 4. Mm -hmm. So definitely you need to give in. Mm -hmm. Or there is an ongoing bleed. You you are sure that you are not going to stop this ongoing bleed. Mm -hmm. And you need to transfuse around 4 to 5 pints of blood. You need not wait. You can activate straight away. So mm -hmm. that is your massive transfusion protocol that you need to activate here. And what else you need to do? Prevent hypothermia. Prevent hypothermia. Okay. Massive transfusion protocol. How does you? Uh, how will you do the massive transfusion protocol? Basically, massive transfusion protocol. If we need more than four uh, PRBCs transfusion within one hour, or more than ten within twenty-four hours, we have to activate massive transfusion protocol so that we give uh, PRBC platelet and uh, plasma, uh, that is FFP, in one is to one ratio. So that's to prevent dilution and coagulopathy in the patient. What else you want to do? You said regarding calcium glucose. Calcium. Yeah, we have to give calcium glucose because. Uh, Every pack of PRBC will contain citrate, so it will chelate the calcium. So, uh, what happens is when we give PRBC very rapidly, the patient will go into severe hypocalcemia, which again will promote uh, acidosis because that uh, triad of coagulation cascade won't be activated because calcium won't be will be low so that's why we have to go ahead with either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride that is one to three grams of calcium chloride or three to six grams of calcium gluconate for every four pints of uh, prbc we okay give. so what you can practice is if you are having calcium chloride with you mm -hmm. after every one pint prbc transfusion you will give one, one calcium, calcium chloride, chloride one ampule so when you have calcium gluconate available with you after three prbcs you will give one calcium chloride so that is the equivalence one calcium gluconate is equivalent to three calcium gluconate is equivalent to one calcium chloride so that is the uh, dynamics that you need to keep in your mind so if you have calcium gluconate after every transition you give but the problem with calcium gluconate sorry calcium chloride that's it uh, it 
should not be given via peripherally. It should be given via a center line. So when you are doing for a large procedures and all, definitely surgery, uh, the, there will be a center line. So you need not worry. You can give calcium chloride once in uh, one once you are giving three pint PRBC, you give one calcium chloride. Gluconite you have to give after every one pint PRBC transfusion. So that is the difference that you need to keep in your mind. Okay. Now uh, I'll come back to the resuscitation part of this patient. Uh, we were getting an organized rhythm. Are we getting an organizing rhythm for this patient? Yeah. Maybe after 20 minutes of CPR, we were getting an organized yes. rhythm. But we were not getting an... I will say, physically we were unable to get a pulse. Okay. So, uh, that is the most important thing that I wanted to use the terminology. Mechanically or physically, when we were touching, we were unable to get a pulse. But when we get the echo mission, we were able to see a cardiac contractility. Or when we are able to put out the carotid, there is a CASA protocol, we are able to say carotid because the carotid is already blow out here. So, we didn't do that. But we were able to say cardiac contractility in this patient. So, what you will call this phenomena called as? So, we have to understand when we call this, ideally when we all discuss, we will call it as PEA, right? Pulseless electrical activity. So, you have to understand this is the terminology what you need to remember as pseudo PEA. We can call this as a pseudo PA. There is pulse, but you are unable to feel it physically. But there is a cardiac contractility. Why there is unable to feel? Because of the severe shock. So, you are able to see a cardiac contractility in the echo, and but you are unable to feel the pulse. Or else you can put the vascular probe and see for the carotid whether it is contracting or not. Mm. So, if you are getting that, that is also, uh, it is not actually P. That, so, that is a reason why uh, when we are we were unable to uh, get anything in the carotid because it is shortly blown out. Mm. So, we put the echo mission and we saw that, okay, the heart is contracting. So, we never got a pulse. Mm. We stopped the CPR. Mm. You have to remember that. So, we never got the pulse in this case, but we understood that this is pseudo PA. Then we went ahead with an artery line insertion where we got a good blood pressure. Later on, after starting on him, uh, blood transfusion and all those things. So, remember, you have, there is another terminology, I think, PREM, PREES. I don't remember exactly. Pulse without, echo, uh, pulse uh, with echocardiograph motion, PREM. That is what you will call it as uh, uh, pseudo PA. And the other one, Pulse uh, without uh, an activity. I don't remember what the name, but you remember pseudo PEA and uh, PEA. So, the, uh, what we had is in this case is most likely a pseudo PEA. So, that we need to identify and recognize and treat. So, that's what uh, we have done in this case. And uh, the, the bleeding was stopped. But the problem is that that whole side of the brain, the blood supply is lost. So, uh, maybe he had this sentinel events. Uh, whether he had uh, come back and with the sentinel event initially itself, we could have uh, taken him for a stending. Th that this carot grade 3 could have been prevented uh, in this patient. Okay. So, you have anything else that you wanted to add on? I don't think we should discuss penetrating nectar. That's a totally different journal from this. Okay. So, what will be the take home message for a carotid blowout when you are doing a residency in an area where you are seeing a lot of head and neck cancers. Mm -hmm. Remember, what are the what will be the presentation? A normal bleeding from the oral cavity, mm -hmm. tracheostomy bleed or an external bleeding. Mm -hmm. So, this will be all the presentation. An unexplained shock mm -hmm. in a patient who is taking a head and neck malignancy care, mm -hmm. who is undergoing radiation. Always keep in mind, one of the rarest possibility, but whether it can be a carotid blot where your intervention is very important. And uh, that's what we did in this case. Okay.